Good morning. It's technically the day after, but we can still say Merry Christmas. Glad you are here this morning. Would you stand as we worship and sing together, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come. Welcome to Highland. Like I said, I'm, we hope that you had a wonderful day celebrating the birth of our Savior with your family uh, yesterday, and we're so glad that you were back here with us this morning. If this is your first time here, we'd, we'd love to just welcome you and ask that you would uh, take a little, your phone out. You can take a, not a picture, but point your camera at the little QR code that's on the little worship guide if you grab that coming in. That just lets us know that you were with us and that how we can love you, serve you, and pray for you more. Or you could text HBC to the number 833-912. 2228 uh, there on the screen and so and you can do the same thing if you're at home joining us there well look uh, I'm going to pray continue on in our worship this morning as we continue to lift up the Lord Jesus and then after I'm done praying we're going to turn our attention to the screen where Miss Libby has a children's message for us this morning let's pray father we thank you for meeting us here because of your grace this morning. We thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the joy that you have filled our lives with um, for all those who know you and call you Lord. God, we pray that uh, you would be in our midst as you always are, or as you already are. Father, that uh, you would lift up the Lord Jesus, that we would magnify him, that we would exalt him, that we would worship him this morning, and that you would change lives as a result of that. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, happy Sunday. I hope we're having a fantastic Sunday so far. If you don't know who I am, my name is Miss Libby, and I'm the Children's Director here at Highland Baptist Church. And today, we're going to play a little game called Two Truths and a Lie. Okay, so what's going to happen is I'm going to tell y'all three things about me. But one of those three things is going to be a lie. There's two things that are true and one thing that's a lie, okay? And so your job is to try and figure out which one of the three things is the lie, okay? So here are my three things. Number one, I can wiggle my ears without touching them. Number two, I cannot straighten two of my fingers. 
And number three, I can raise one eyebrow at a time, okay? So, try and figure out what the lie is. While you're thinking about it, I'm going to be reading a verse for y'all. This is 1 John chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says this, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. Okay, so, you ready to hear what the lie is? Drum roll, please. <laughs> the lie is, is that I cannot wiggle my ears. I can raise one eyebrow at a time and I cannot straighten these two fingers. Did you get it right? Well, what if I played this game with God? Do you think that God would get the lie right every time? If I told him like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things about me, do you think he could guess the one lie out of those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things about me? Absolutely. But how? Because God knows every single thing about you. God created you. And so he knows absolutely everything about you. There is absolutely no fooling God. Just like how I fooled y'all. God, God can't be fooled because God knows everything about us. God knows everything about me, everything about you, everything about your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your cousin, the person sitting next to you in church today. God knows everything everything about them okay and so um you can't fool god you can never ever fool god whenever we tell ourselves uh i don't feel like reading the bible today i want to watch tv but then we complain about not having enough, enough time to um read the bible god knows that you're just fooling yourself god knows that you're lying to yourself and you're fooling yourself and that you really do have time you just don't want to okay and so God knows whenever you're trying to have a relationship with him, whenever you're, um, whenever you just don't feel like you have enough time to do anything, God knows whenever you're reading his Bible, whenever you're praying to him, he knows everything, okay? There is absolutely no fooling God because God knows everything, okay? So if you're in that place right now, if you're in that place where you're telling yourself that you don't have enough time to do the things that God wants you to do. Quit lying to yourself and pick up this Bible, read it, pray to Him right before you go to bed in the uh, right before you go to bed at night, and right as you wake up in the morning, come to church, learn more about Him, so you can start that relationship with Him. Okay? Because there is absolutely no fooling God. God knows exactly where you are. Okay? So let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for all that you bless us with. God, I pray that you just help us to understand that there's no fooling you. God, you know absolutely everything about us. And God, I pray that you help us to be true, be true to our own, be true to ourselves, and help us to start that relationship with you if we haven't already, God. And God, I pray that if um, if we do have a relationship with you, that we just keep up the hard work and um, just read uh, read your word every night, um, talk to you every single day, and learn more about you. God, I pray that you be with us as we go throughout the rest of this day, and I pray that we glorify you in all that we do. Now I pray. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship and sing, What Child Is This and We Three Kings?
Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in just a few moments at, in verse 1 through 12 for our text. Our title this morning is Come and See, Go and Tell. So this is uh, the second day of Christmas, so merry second day of Christmas if you celebrate that way. If you continue to celebrate that way, you still have 10 more days to go. That's good. More presents for you. So, I did have a friend growing up that his mother did the 12 days of Christmas, and it was great. I don't, I don't know why I couldn't ever convince my parents to do that. So, <laughs> it was great for him. So, um, so if um, it's, uh, I hope, you know, yesterday was a, a good day for you and your family as you celebrated the birth of Jesus. And as we begin to get into the word, before we jump into that, um, let's do a quick poll of the room. Um, day after Christmas, right? So who has already taken your tree down? Don't be shy. I know there's one. I mean, I don't know, no, but I imagine in here there's one that's already taken it down. And if they're not here, they may be at home because they were too tired yesterday taking it down. <laughs> so online, you may be one of those people. Okay, so who has taken maybe some of their Christmas decorations down? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, who's going to do it later today? I'm pretty sure that's going to happen at our house. Uh, who couldn't wait for Christmas to get here just so, man, okay, I'm tired of sitting at the stores. I'm tired. Of, I just want Christmas to get here so we can move on with the new year. Anybody like that? Yeah, sure. Um, it gets so hectic at this time of year. It gets busy. It's exhausting sometimes that sometimes we just can't wait for the whole ordeal to get over. I mean, I don't mind the busyness being over, but let me caution you as I caution myself. We don't want to move past Christmas too quickly yet. There's an aspect of Christmas that we need to address before we move into the new year. In fact, it's one of the most important parts of the Christmas story. It's found in Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So if you would, would you please stand with me as we honor God's word this morning as we read it together, or as we read it. And you follow along. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is, so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it, when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray. Father of all good and perfect gifts, you absolutely outdid yourself when you gave us your only begotten son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would continue to help us to celebrate his birth to be changed by his presence daily in our lives and to commit to pointing others to him. Help us now as we seek to understand your word through your Holy Spirit. And we ask all of this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. You may be seated. So if we don't want to move past Christmas just yet, then we need a good reason to camp out at this text for today. And I want to give you that in three global truths found in the Christmas story in Matthew 2, that no matter who you are, where you've been in life, what you've done, what you haven't done, whether you've been in church or not in church or wherever it is, you may find yourself in life. These are three 
global truths found in the Christmas story in Matthew 2. Truth number one, God invites everyone to come to King Jesus. God invites everyone to come to King Jesus. One of the key features of the Christmas story, or any Christmas play that we see throughout the holidays, is the Christmas star, right? You've all, I mean, when you're the little kid, you want to be the star. Not just the star of the show, but you literally want to be the Christmas star. That's a kind of a big deal. Well, it was a big deal. In fact, look at what God does with this star. He uses nature itself to announce the birth and the location of King Jesus. Look at verses 1 and 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star, his star, and have come to worship him. And then go down to verses 9 and 10. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star... They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. By the way, Matthew uses the same phrase that Luke uses of the shepherds. When they come to Jesus, they rejoice with exceedingly great joy. So Jesus here is so awesome, so great, that God the Father announced the birth of his Son by using the heavens to declare who he is. I mean, why would God do that? Well, number one, Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens, right? In Psalm 19-1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Habakkuk 3-3, his splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. God uses this star to announce Jesus' birth and the location to the wise men. Now, we don't know what the star was. There's all kinds of speculations. It may have been a triple conjunction. It may have been a supernova. It may have been whatever. But whatever it is, we know that God used it to point us, and specifically these wise men, and then us, to his son, Jesus. So who were these wise men? Well, I mean, were they really smart? Were they funny, like wise guys? Were there three of them? Well, not. we don't know. There may have been three, but uh, we aren't told. People assume that there are three because why? There's three gifts, right? So we're not sure. We're not sure if there were three. We do know that they were pagan. That means non-believing. Uh, they weren't God worshippers at this time. They were pagan astronomers. Some people see astrology in this. Uh, it could be, but they were more about the astronomy aspect, I believe. They were we, uh, Eastern wisdom sages who studied the constellations. And then they speculated on their meaning. So they came from a faraway land, it says, uh, in the east. That was possibly Babylon or Persia. They would have been both politically and socially important in their own country. Their primary job was to study the heavens and then to tell the king to suggest the meaning to the king. So in a way, they were sort of like his cabinet. They were his... Uh, right-hand guys, but it came to doing things of significant, national significance, whether they should go to war, they would look to the heavens. Whether he should embark on an, a great journey, they, they would look to the heavens. Maybe to build a large uh, building of some sort in his honor, they would look to the heavens if this was a good time to do it. Or sometimes it could be that a great ruler has been born, which is why Matthew uses the word his star. So there's no doubt that on the night when one of, these sta one of these sages was observing the heavens as he was looking out into the vast expanse of space, he noticed something so spectacular that drew his attention that would eventually draw the other wise man to a little bitty podunk town off the beaten path called Bethlehem. Now, I'm not sure when creative birth announcements and gender reveal parties became a thing, but uh, they're a thing, right? Just go on Instagram or any social media. They're a thing. In fact, uh, some are pretty creative. Uh, we've only done one in our uh, children's uh, births. Um, uh, and that was number five because numbers four through one, really, that wasn't as much of a thing then. And so I guess we've, we've succumbed to that too at some point um, by number five. But, um, and, but he, sometimes they are creative. But sometimes they're just downright disturbing and, cre and scary, right? And so I want you to notice this one. There's a picture up there. Throw that up there. And then I'm going to give you a, 
This is one person's uh, creative, although disturbing, gender reveal. This is how the conversation goes. The wife, talking about her husband, quoting her husband, he gave it some thought and decided that if we're going to do it, we would have to think outside the box. Hence, the box behind the giant baby busting out of. The husband says, no one at the party saw the giant baby coming. You think? I would have seen that coming. Would you have seen that coming? No. All right, you can throw it off that. That's enough of that picture. See, we can come up with creative gender reveals and all those things, and unfortunately some scary ones, but no one trumps God when it comes to the birth of Jesus and his announcement. God gave his birth announcement in the most creative, out-of-the-box thought, and no one saw the baby coming except for these astronomers in a faraway land who were looking for something out of this world, so to speak. He used a star in the sky to draw pagan astronomers to Jesus. And he uses different things to draw us to him as well. Think about your own story and what God did in your life to draw you to Jesus. It may have been the preaching of a preacher in this church or another church. It may have been a family member. It may have been an accident of some sort. It may have been a tragedy of some sort. But God may have used, God used something to draw you to Jesus. And here he used a star to draw these pagan astronomers to Jesus, the same star that we talk about every year during Christmas season. And this star still draws us to King Jesus. And we don't come to King Jesus. We're not drawn to King Jesus so that we can fulfill our wish list, so that we can fill all and every desire that we have. We come to him. We are drawn to him by God because he is the rightful king and we need to be rescued. Amen? Amen. And so everyone, no matter where they are in this world, God invites everyone, as we see in the astronomers here from this eastern land, God invites everyone to come to King Jesus. Number two, God desires that everyone worships King Jesus. So not only does God want to draw everyone to King Jesus, but there's a purpose in this drawing. He wants everyone to come and worship King Jesus. Look with me in verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. There's one story that says that, that these three wise men showed up late uh, to their house and they walked into the house and they saw Joseph and Mary and little Jesus. And of course, Joseph's taken aback was, uh, he, he asked why they were there because they're kind of disturbing them. Uh, his wife had been nursing Jesus and now Jesus needed to go to bed. And well, the first man said, well, the first wise man said, well, I've brought gold for the child. And so Joseph thanked him and asked uh, that they go ahead and leave. And, but the second guy spoke up and he said, but I've brought frankincense for the child. And then again, Joseph thanked them, but it was getting, he was starting to get kind of annoyed. And he's, he's trying to push them out the door when he's just kind of ushering them out the door. The third guy puts his hand on the threshold to stop himself. But he says, but wait, I've got myrrh. Some of you will get that later. It's a stupid joke, but it's probably why I was in brackets right here. No, I'm just kidding. It's not. But the wise men, they come from far away. They knew the child was unlike any other child. He has the star in the sky that directed them to the exact house where he was. Think about if you were one of these guys. You've seen his star. It directs you to the exact location of where this child is. When you walk through that door, is there any thought in your mind that this is just a normal kid? Absolutely not. There, there's no thought in your mind that this is just like any other baby born on any other street in the world. That there's something different here. There's something great and grand at work here. And so they, they come in to a house. By the way, Joseph, uh, they had, Jesus was born in a stable or a, you know, a barn-like uh, aspect, but here he's not. Um, 
most likely there's some time that has passed. We don't know. It could have been two years. It doesn't mean that it's two years. Um, it could have been up to two years because uh, Herod says to kill all the infant, uh, uh, male infants two years and under, but it doesn't have to be two years. It just, we know that there's been some time that has passed because they've moved from the barn to a house. Now they're in a house, they're in Bethlehem. And so they come in and they see Jesus with his mother, Mary. And, Ma and Matthew writes this next phrase as if it were the natural response of seeing this special baby. What do they do? They come in and they fall to their faces and they worship him. They prostrated, that's the word, they prostrated themselves before a baby. Think about this, they worshiped a baby. Think about how crazy that sounds. Think about how that crazy that would have looked here are these really, really important and connected guys. They, they probably have above higher intelligence for what they did in life. They probably earn more than the average worker. They were higher up on the social ladder than the average person. And yet when they come in, they fall to their faces and worship this baby. He doesn't tell us what was said here or if they sang, but it says, tell us what they did. They presented Jesus with their treasures, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Matthew doesn't tell us uh, this, um, but you know, we don't know how they accepted them, but we do know that there was some sort of acceptance because Matthew doesn't say they did not, I mean, they didn't reject them. So they offer these gifts to Jesus and to Mary here and Joseph. And in these gifts, the gold in the early church, they understood the gold to represent Jesus's divinity. I mean, his royalty, sorry, his royalty. I mean, wealthy people, think about it. Wealthy people would often gift the new king gold. This is how we're, uh, we read about Solomon in the Old Testament. He accumulated vast amounts of gold often because other people were giving it to him, other kingdoms were giving it to him. Frankincense emphasized Jesus's divinity, is that it was used, it was a, a, an incense that was used in royal processions in the Old Testament. It was used in the service and the worship of God in Exodus 30 and Leviticus 2. And then myrrh emphasized Jesus's humanity. It was a spice, a perfume that was used in lots of different ap applications. The one that was most used was when a person was being anointed. And so where do we see Jesus being anointed in the two spots? One was at his birth in Matthew. The other is at his burial with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. So these men here, when they offered Jesus these gifts, they understood what so many people fail to grasp that the God of the universe, the ones who put the heavens in its place, has invited you and me to come and worship King Jesus. In worship, we're not to come and offer God our trinkets and these little gifts that, and the little things that we think we can do for him. What God wants is our hearts. So we come and worship and we give Jesus our lives. We are living sacrifices, Paul says in Romans 12, 1. That is our worship to God, is that we give him all of us. In 2006, I had the privilege to go on a mission trip to Uruguay um, with Ray and Cindy Hodgins. Many of you know Ray and Cindy, and Ray, uh, of course, has gone on to be with the Lord already, but... Um, Ray and Cindy were there in Uruguay uh, to reach the deaf community um, there. And it was one of the most fascinating trips that I had ever been on. Um, we did a lot of smiling, a lot of nodding, a lot of motioning with our hands for things that we were trying to say that we didn't know what we were saying. Um, I remember Ray, before we left, saying that um, he said we were going to stay for the Sunday morning worship service. And back then, I, I was a, a worship leader. Um, and so I'm thinking, well, this ought to be interesting. <laughs> uh, they're deaf, Ray. <laughs> and we're not. I don't know how this is going to work. So we sat in this big circle. And, uh, and Ray led the singing vocally. But he also led the singing uh, with uh, his hands, with signing. But only the hearing, like us, were singing out loud. 
there was this one guy in the circle who had this big drum. And he was keeping us on tempo, but it wasn't so much the tempo that he was doing. What he was doing is as, he was, as Ray was signing, as we were singing, as he was hitting this drum, the deaf community in the church were feeling the vibrations off of this drum. And so they were signing, we were singing, we were all worshiping together. In our worship, there was no distinction between the deaf and the hearing. There was no one handicapped from worshiping God. It did not matter if you were a hearing middle-class American or you were a deaf Uruguayan in poverty. The focus of our worship was not the limitations of each one of us individually. The focus of our worship was King Jesus. All because we worship the same Lord, we were changed. Every one of us were changed a little bit more to understand the global call of God. That even some of the most forgotten people in the world, the deaf community, God wants to save and to change daily into his image. And God wants to do that for every single one of us and every one of you that are joining us online. God wants to do that for every single person in this city. God draws people to Jesus so that they would be saved by Jesus and then being changed daily by Jesus. God has a heart for the nations and he wants to change our hearts in that process. So number three, we've seen that God draws, or every, God invites everyone to come to Jesus. God uh, wants everyone to worship King Jesus. But then lastly, God sends his people to reach the nations for King Jesus. God sends his people to reach the nations for King Jesus. You know, Christmas isn't just about the celebration of Jesus' birth. There's also a commissioning to share the Christmas story with others. And that's what we're seeing here in verse 12. Look at verse 12 with me. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So Herod, and we haven't camped out on Herod. Um, maybe we'll do that at another time. But, but Herod wanted to kill the uh, killed Jesus because he uh, feels like Jesus is a, a threat to his own throne. And so he would eventually kill all male infants two years and under in Bethlehem. Herod didn't want to share the throne, but we know as we read the Bible that the throne always belongs to Jesus. It always has and it always will. And so God warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. They obeyed God and they went home. So what it says, to their own country by a different way. Now, I don't want to read too much into this, but I do think that there's some important notes worth pondering here. Number one, we know that they had, they experienced a head and a heart level change because they obeyed God. How do we know that? Well, at first they're pagan. They're following a star. They don't know who God is. They don't know that God created the heavens and the earth. They don't know anything about that. They're just following a star because it's significant in their world. And the world in which they live is significant enough to, we're going to pack up and we're going to see where this goes. And so they did. They followed it all because of its significance. But after they met the baby, or when they met the baby, they what? Worshipped him. They were changed. That's a change word, that their hearts were changed toward this baby. They were given a dream. We don't know if it was one received it or collectively or whatever, but we, knew, we know that they were given a dream and we know that they obeyed God. And they did not obey God to check off a list, guys. How do we know that? Because they didn't want any harm to come to Jesus. There's love here. They love this child. I don't know why, I don't know how, I wasn't in that room, we weren't there, but something happened in these guys to where they didn't want any harm to come to this child. They knew from the dream of what Herod was planning to do. And so they had a head level change and then a heart level change. But number two, they left Bethlehem, they left the presence of Jesus different from when they arrived. Matthew says they departed to their own country by another way. They came to Jesus as pagan worshipers of the heavens, but they left as worshipers of the one who created the heavens. Number three, they undoubtedly went home to tell others about King Jesus. I mean, as you read their story, or as Matthew, you read Matthew's record of their story, 
Silence about this newborn king is absolutely inconceivable. Like, I can't imagine them going home and the king saying, hey, what happened? Oh, nothing. None. Just, you know, same old, same old. Can you imagine that? That wouldn't happen, would it? They, 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 they've seen all of this stuff. I mean, the king and his court has given them permission, probably given them uh, provisions to go on their trip, to take this long journey. They go all the way there. They experience all these wonderful things. They come back. There is no way that Okay, well, that was fun. Let's move on to no, something else. No, he, he, he's going to throw a banquet. He, he's going to invite all the nobility. His family's going to be there. All the staff is going to be there. They're going to throw a banquet, and they're going to, at this banquet, after they eat, they're sitting after supper, and they want to hear, what was the journey? What did you find out? What happened? So can you imagine what's happening in this? Is that these three or four or five or how many ever guys it was, they stand up and one after another, they're kind of filling in different parts of the story. Man, we saw the star king, just like we told you, and we followed it and we got to Jerusalem and we met the ruler there. His name was Herod. And he was telling us about this stuff. And then he brought these other guys in that were their religious leaders. And they were telling us about this prophecy, about this, this, this king that's coming. And so then Herod, you know, sent us to this place that we had a hard time finding. It's called Bethlehem. And we got there and all of a sudden the star is leading the way and it's shining right on the house. And we went in and there's this baby. And so we we couldn't help it when we just fell down and we began to worship him and we presented those gifts to him and then that night king when we were you know asleep getting ready to leave the next day we we're gonna head back to jerusalem to tell herod what we found but man we had a dream i mean we had a dream that said don't do it you need to take another route and so here we are we took another route and we, we wanted to tell you king i mean can you feel the tension, just the, the listeners, okay, who is this baby? That would, God, that the creator, that the heavens would declare this, all of this and set all of this up. Who is this? And they're leaning forward on their seats at the edge of their cushions. And one by one, they're like, his name is Jesus. He's the Messiah. Can you imagine? There is no way that these guys would go home and be silent about what they have heard, seen, and experienced. I truly believe that Matthew's main concern here, as he places this story of the Magi in this specific spot, I believe what he's doing is he's showing the connection of that God has a heart for the nations, but not just to save them, but to send them, because he's putting it, these are bookends of Matthew's gospel. That you have God drawing the nations in Matthew 2, and then God sending the church to the nations in Matthew 28. When God draws us, he then saves us and sends us to the nations, to the lost. In fact, the story of the wise men describes God's global plan of making disciples. It does. It's easy to see. God invites everyone to come to salvation in King Jesus there's this head level change where there's a part in us, in our own story, where if you've met Jesus, you realize, hey, I'm not the boss. I only mess things up. I'm only separated from God. Therefore, I'm giving my life to him. I'm giving my life, my all to Jesus. I'm going to follow him from now on. There is a head level change that happens. And then as we begin to follow Jesus, just like these, these, these uh, uh, wise men here, God desires everyone to not just follow Jesus or to, to uh, uh, come to salvation in Jesus, but God desires everyone to worship King Jesus. There's this heart level change that as a person follows Jesus, Jesus begins to change that person day by day by day. They begin to reflect Jesus' character. Jesus' passions become that person's passions. Jesus' agenda becomes that person's agenda. This person doesn't turn over a new leaf. This person isn't trying harder to do what God wants. They're being changed daily from the inside out because they're spending time with Jesus. And then as our hearts, our heads are being changed, our hearts are being changed daily, then guess what follows? Our hands then are committed to the mission of Jesus. God sends his people to reach the world for Jesus. What is the mission of Jesus? It's Luke 19, 10, what Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, and it's our mission too. 
We are to take the message of the gospel, the story of Jesus, to people that do not know Jesus yet. I mean, you may have put up the decorations, thrown out the tree, taken down the lights, but the Christmas story is not complete. It's not over. We spend so much part of the Christmas story talking about the come and see aspect, but don't forget about the go and tell aspect. So let me ask you a question. Have you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Has there been a head-level change in your life? You know that there was a point in my life where I was heading one way and I made a conscious decision to not and to trust in Jesus and begin to follow him. Has that happened in your life? If not, it can today. In just a few moments, we're gonna have a time of response. I want you to come down. I'd love to be able to talk with you more about how that could be true in your life today. So has there been a head level change? Have you experienced salvation that is only found in Jesus? Number two, are you being changed, church, daily by Jesus? Are you spending time in God's word daily? Are you spending time in worship daily with Jesus? Is there a heart level change happening in your life? If there's not, then commit now. That now and 2022, uh, 2022 is going to be the year that you grow closer to the Lord than you've ever grown before. And are you part of his mission of pointing others to him? Are you committing to the mission of Jesus? So I pray that we're going to roll into 2022 with a renewed commitment to share the story of Jesus. Because as we say, this here is the huddle. We love it. But out there is the game. That's just as important out there as it is in here. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us first. We thank you for King Jesus. We pray that you would rule over our time of response, just like you have led us to this far in our service. God, that you would change hearts and lives and that you would change minds, God. That you would draw people to Jesus and that those that you draw would turn from their sin and place their trust in Jesus, in Jesus alone. God, for those that need a, a, a fresh commitment to spending time with you, to being on mission with you, God, would you, would you move in their life that they would do that? Lord, we love you, and we give this time of response as an offering of worship. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we have our time of response this morning? Thou hast seen thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy Thank you for being here. Uh, our last Christmas gift to you is uh, it's 1048. So, uh, <laughs> so we are so glad that you are here with us this morning. We're looking forward to a wonderful new year um, and all that God has planned uh, and everything that we're going to be able to be a part of um, going into the new year. Um, Wednesday night activities, just to be reminded, will resume January 5th. So Merry Christmas again. Happy New Year. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. We love you. We'll see you next time.